Since the 1980s, more than two and a half million Americans have been pulled into a cult. It's estimated there are 3,000 active cultic groups in America alone. From Nexium to the Branch Davidians in Waco, from the scandal at Sarah Lawrence to Bikram Yoga, Wild Wild Country to Heaven's Gate, everyone is talking about them. But what makes a cult a cult? How do they wield such power? On this fascinating episode of Navigating Narcissism, I'm honored to speak with Dr. Yanya Lalich, one of the world's foremost experts on cults and coercion, who lost 10 years of her life when she was lured into a radical political group that turned out to be a cult. She reveals the role of narcissism at the heart of every cult and breaks down the frightening tactics they use to systematically coerce millions. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. Dr. Yanya, it's such an honor to meet you. I just love your work. It's so um, complimentary to the work I do on narcissism in individual yes. relationships. Well, thank you. It's wonderful to meet you as well. And I love your books as well. You spend a, a lot of time helping people who have left cult-organized systems or who are trying to leave or even people who've gotten drawn in and you talk to their family members. And cults mm -hmm. are a big word out there. Every other day, there's a new documentary about a cult. This is top of mind for people. So let's just start with basics. Can you define what a cult is? Okay. A cult is essentially a closed social system. And it has four features that are important to me. The authoritarian or charismatic leader, the transcendent belief system, the systems of control, and the systems of influence. Uh, the first is that it has an authoritarian leader who is most often, almost always, a narcissist um, and who demands all loyalty and all obedience and you're not allowed to question that person. And the leader is typically the founder or the originator of the belief system. Uh, so the second feature is the belief system, which I call a transcendent belief system. And by that, I mean it's, a, it's an ideology or a belief system that basically gives you the answer to everything, mm. the past, the present, and the future. And the philosophy behind the belief system is the end justifies the means. Once you have a philosophy that says the end justifies the means, that means you can be asked to do anything, and as long as it's in the service of the goals of the organization or the leader's wishes, it's okay. Um, so that puts people into a kind of a sticky wicket because most people come into the cult, unless they're born in it, with their own sense of morality. Mm -hmm. And over time, they have to give up their own morality to the, what I say, the immorality of the leader uh, because they are following these end justifies the means orders. And the this, this third and fourth features are systems of influence and systems of control. What I mean by systems of control are the very, very overt rules and regulations. So that would be things like they may have you dressing a certain way, uh, speaking a certain way, they may 
have rules about who you can marry or not marry, how many children to have, how to raise the children, where to live, who to live with, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These are the very obvious control mechanisms. The less obvious are the systems of influence. These are the social psychological techniques or tactics that prey on your emotions. So this is where they're pushing your buttons, right? They're, they're preying on guilt and shame and love and anger and fear, right? And since we have responded to those things all of our lives mostly, we immediately don't pick up that there's something wrong here, that my buttons are being pushed all the time, right? And that I'm reacting in this way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. The purpose of that, which is basically in those two combined, the controls and the influences, the purpose of that uh, which is the indoctrination system, is to attack the self. The cult essentially wants to take apart yourself so that they can rebuild you as a cult persona, right? So they want to get rid of your instincts, your sense of self-trust, your belief in yourself, your self-confidence, etc. So you will essentially be kind of torn down without necessarily realizing it, and built back up according to the principles of the group. So those are the four features. And then, of course, most of these groups are exploiting people in some way, either sexually, financially, certainly emotionally, sometimes all three. You, to me, literally just described a narcissistic relationship, right? Yes. Is you, mm -hmm. You've talked about an authoritarian person who mm -hmm. expects and almost requires loyalty and obedience, they have this belief system that it almost feels like a permanent gaslighting. It's not falsifiable. You cannot ever give evidence to the contrary, because if you do, it will not be heard and integrated, but you will be shut down, right? And you'll exactly. be told there's something wrong with you. And then you brought up something so important when you were talking about this transcendent belief system, which is this almost this slide in morality, the things that you, ethical systems, even legal, you know, adherence and moral codes you once adhered to, you start giving up on those so you can survive yes. in this cultic system. In a narcissistic relationship, I have had numerous survivors say, I stopped being me and started doing things that I never dreamed I would do. I call it sort of the slide in morality just to survive in the relationship. And then when you talk about the systems of control, well, all narcissistic relationships are characterized by control. And the systems of influence really feel like manipulation, behaving in a way that exactly. induces guilt, right? So that's every narcissistic relationship. People feel like they can't move around in these relationships because they feel guilty or that they're violating the relational code or that they're going to be abandoned. But then mm -hmm. what you said, which is shockwaving me right now, is this concept of indoctrinating the person, attacking the self, tearing down a person so you can rebuild them in a way that is functional for the cult leader and secondarily the cult system. What yes. you describe in a cult almost feels a little bit more intentional, but that's every narcissistic relationship, whether it's a parent or a partner or a boss, that they don't care about your individual self. They're going to break that down. So what's mm -hmm. left is a human being that exists in their service. The narcissistic person isn't rubbing their hands together like an evil genius. It is happening in this very under the radar, slow way where it is a slow brick by brick taking a part of a person or if it's a narcissistic parent, the first time that child exerts their autonomy game mm -hmm. over. The child will immediately be shamed. The child will experience a parent's resentment, live with the cataclysmic fear of abandonment. That's too traumatizing. So the child, in order to survive, has to engage in buy-in. So we're working in similar spaces, but the difference is you're talking about a group. I'm talking about an individual relationship. So how big does a group or an organization have to be 
to be considered a cult. There are one-on-one cults. Mm. Uh, there are family cults, as wow. as I'm sure you've run yeah. into. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and cer- and what you described about the children is interesting because for those children who are born in a cult, they experience exactly that. Wow. They're not to express any autonomy, so they don't go through the same developmental stages as as we did when we grew up, or someone who is not involved in a coercive situation. Mm. Um, So when they get out, they have all of that to kind of redo, in a sense, Mm -hmm. um, the developmental work. Uh, So, um, yeah, it can be any size. I mean, some cults are huge, thousands of members. Uh, Most of them boast about the number of members they actually Mm. have, but Mm -hmm. there are groups with thousands. And then I've, you know, I've worked with many small family cults and also the one-on-one cults, which are exactly, as you say, really narcissistic relationships. Um, and I, I think one one thing I do want to mention, um, because you said narcissists aren't these evil people, mm-hmm. you know, planning this all out. I think that is one slight difference with cult yeah, leaders. I, agree. I think, mo- I believe that most, I mean, I've been doing this for 35 mm-hmm. years, and I can't tell you the stories I have heard And I believe that most cult leaders know what they're doing Mm -hmm. and that most of them are what we call malignant narcissists in that they have a little bit of psychopathy and they're very, very evil and very harmful. I mean, we can can look at at two recent examples of Keith Raniere and Larry Ray of the Sarah Lawrence cult. I mean, it's unfathomable, especially Larry Ray, what he did to those kids. So... Cult leaders, I think, tend to be a bit more abusive and harmful than your run-of-the-mill narcissist, if you will. <laughs> I totally agree. And it, it comes down to that intentionality, right? And and mm-hmm, I think that, mm-hmm. you know, we you're, I'm sure you're more than familiar, and we've talked about it on this podcast before, this idea of the, tar- the dark tetrad of narcissism, mm-hmm. psychopathy, Machiavellianism, and sadism. Yes. Those qualities yes. are obviously every single cult leader ever. I like that formatting better because it accounts for the exploitation the psychopathic cruelty, which is a lack of remorse, and there's an intentionality and that sadistic flair. And I think in intimate relationships, people struggle with that. Like, are they? Do they want to do this? Ranieri and Ray, they wanted to. That this was an, an obsessive, a delusionally obsessive need for power. When you talk about. Um, First of all, I want to go back a minute because I think everyone knows who Keith Raniere and Nexium, what that's about. I think fewer people know about Larry Ray. Could you just give us a brief overview of that? I just want to make sure that everyone has a context for that. Larry Ray was um, basically a con artist and had been in prison for fraud or something. When he got out of prison, his daughter, who was a student at Sarah Lawrence living in a dorm, had some roommates. His daughter said, oh, my dad's coming to live with us for a while. So he actually moved into the dorm with these young people. He essentially indoctrinated these young people into believing that he was this like superhuman being. And then he convinced them that everything they did was wrong and hurting him and they were owing him money. And he was very violent in the abuse of them. Eventually they moved to an apartment in New York um, and he had one of the young women become a prostitute he tortured people, literally tortured people. You know, I knew so much about Ranieri and what he did. <clears throat> I thought nobody could really beat that. And then Larry Ray came along and I thought, wow, he's he was beyond the pale. So, so that's who Larry Ray is. And fortunately, he got convicted. Um, he got a pretty good sentence, not as good as Ranieri yeah. got. <laughs> yeah. um, and then most recently, Isabella, his so-called second-in-command, just got convicted, Mm -hmm. which I actually wrote a piece about Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. for MSNBC because she she was definitely a victim, and and not that that cult members who do horrific things shouldn't be held accountable, but I think the courts also need to take into account what happens to people under coercion because Mm -hmm. we have to follow orders. Mm -hmm. And then it depends on what level you're at. But what happens in cases like Isabella is that through the indoctrination, we, we enter this state of mind that I call bounded choice. 
Mm. We've been so enclosed in this self-sealing system. We have no reality checks, no other feedback. We're at the mercy of the leader. We believe our entire life future depends on staying with and obeying this leader to the point mm. where, yes, we have choices, but our choices are confined and constrained by this system that we're locked in. So sure, if it's something insignificant, like, oh, what am I going to have for lunch today or whatever? Yeah, you have a choice about that. But if it's something significant, like, can I leave? Can I challenge the leader? No. Those are thoughts that you cannot entertain because you know that if you entertain those thoughts and, God forbid, act on them, you will basically die, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. either a literal or figurative death. Mm -hmm. Many cults say to you, if you leave, you're going to die You know, of yeah. some dread disease. You have to give up everything, give up your entire identity at that point. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And most people, when they're in that state, cannot do that. And this is why so many people, especially at a higher level in a cult, um, experience what we call, and I'm sure you're familiar, moral injury. Yeah. You know, which is the effect of not just what happened to you, but what you did to others mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or that you saw happen to others and that you couldn't do anything about. So, yes, I think someone who's at the level of Isabella Pollock and the dastardly things she did at, at his command or knowing that's what he would want, she needed to be held accountable. But but I think we, the courts and law enforcement also need to understand yeah. and have a little bit of compassion uh, for the person who's caught in that position. Mm -hmm. I found this concept of bounded choice to be one of the most fascinating things I'd ever read. I'd never, that terminology really captured something. Correct me if I'm wrong. We have a certain spectrum of choice, okay? What you're describing as bounded choice is an absolute narrowing of that of that spectrum of choice, what you're calling a self-sealing system where you don't have any glimpse of a touchstone or reality outside of that relationship. So although one looking from the outside will say, there's a door, walk through it, that <laughs> is actually that full spectrum of choice no longer exists. It's like the door doesn't exist or the door yeah. is locked, right? Because the reason this is so, mm, for me, is that this is in many ways the paradox of people in narcissistic relationships. Again, not nearly at the level of what we're talking about in terms of the level of coercion and danger and harm of stories we're talking about. But in, even in your garden variety narcissistic relationship, that spectrum of choice narrows to this really bounded realm of if I leave, people may think badly of me. I might, you know, it, it, the system is not going to understand who this person's about. So the custody of the children will be affected or my culture will cast me out or I financially may not be or, able to make it. Or, or he'll come after me or yes. I'll lose the children. Or, Correct. Or right. the post-separation abuse. So, and I think this is every narcissistic relationship ever. And that what happens is even therapists are guilty of this, which is supposed to be a compassionate system. Forget about law enforcement on all those other advocacy and, and um, justice systems. They don't understand bounded choice. Even therapists don't. So we'll often get into this mindset of like, well, leaving is an option. And I'm often like squirming in my chair. I'm like, I don't know that it is. When you gave me this term, bounded choice, I just want to let you know, Do Dr. Yanya, this terminology has greatly helped therapists. So thank you for that. And I've sort of been the no. mouthpiece for that term in clinical realms. And because it's a, it's a, it really gets at what survivors can. They're like, I don't feel like I can leave this. So like, yeah, literally I know I can but I actually don't think I can. I so much appreciate that. Um, and, you know, I mean, that idea of there's the door and you can't go through it. I lived that for five years mm. in the cult that I was in. I was ready to leave and I couldn't, I could not figure out how to do it. I would get up every morning, get in the shower, cry my eyes out because we weren't allowed to cry. We should have no emotions. Mm. 
And I'd get in my car and I would just wish that I'd be killed in a car accident because it was the only way I could see to get out. Mm -hmm. And that is, that is the phenomenon that people who haven't lived through this don't Mm -mm. have a really difficult time understanding. So since you said that, and I heard you use the word we a few times as though there's a sense of belonging for you in cult survivors, this has been your experience. (laughs) Can can we talk about that? Can you tell us about the group that you were in and what that experience was like? So um, I was 30 years old. I had already graduated from college with honors. I had been a Fulbright scholar. Um, I don't say these things to boast, but to let people know that It's not stupid, weird, crazy people who get into cults, but they look for the best and the brightest. I met a woman who was a friend of a friend, and we would have these great, we'd go for coffee and have these great political conversations. This was right at the end of the Vietnam War. So Mm -hmm. people on the left were kind of looking for, what do we do now? What do we do now? Um, So she said, at one point, she asked to meet me at my house, and she came over with another person and said, you know, we have this study group. It's just for women. Uh, It's called Women in the State. And we're, you know, reading about and trying to understand the role of women in the state, you know, state with a capital S. Mm -hmm. And, um, of course, that sounded interesting to me. I'd always had this intellectual side to me. And um, I thought, well, I'll meet new people. That sounds great. So I joined the study group. Little did I know that it was a front group for a cult. And little did I know that probably half half of the people there, five out of the ten people there, were part of this background organization that I didn't know about. Um, so we did these readings of like Marx and Lenin and Chairman Mao, things like that. It, and we'd be asked to be the person to present the reading at the next meeting. And of course, when, when I presented, it, they praised me and told me how wonderful and brilliant I was. And, you know, all this, what we call love bombing, you know, making me feel very special and loved. And then a, a, couple, a little while later, she asked to meet with me at my house again and said, well, uh, what are you learning in the study group? And I said, well, I'm, I'm learning that in order to really make social change, uh, you have to have a, a Marxist a disciplined Marxist-Leninist organization. And she said, well, what if we told you we have one? And I'm like, what? <laughs> you know? mm. and, and she said, yes, we have this international organization and it's um, uh, really big and, you know, wouldn't you like to join? And I was like, sure. So she said, oh, but, you know, first you, so this is kind of bait and switch that they do. Mm-hmm. So she, first you have to fill out this questionnaire. So I filled out the questionnaire, which basically asked me everything about my life, my parents, my bank accounts, my passport number, everything, everything, everything. Uh, And then I was admitted. And at the time, the group didn't even have a name, and I didn't even know it had a leader. Um, But over time, uh, I learned that. And um, it was a, a small group then, maybe 25, 30 people. Uh, We grew. We were extremely disciplined, very restricted. We worked 20 hours days, seven days a week, month after month, year after year. Uh, People had various assignments. We had a big print shop and a publishing house and a research institute and, you know, the staff headquarters. Um, All of the newspapers in San Francisco said we were a cult. And of course, we then did damage control. We're like, no, 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 they're just red baiting us, you know. Um, And most of the time, we sat in circles and criticized each other (laughs) and tore people down. And the purpose of that was following the guidelines of Chairman Mao of China, that no matter what the criticism, you have to accept the kernel of truth, which basically meant you could be criticized for anything. So, for example, at one point I was sent to New York to ask one of our supporters for whatever the equivalent of a million dollars was back then, which I went and did, was embarrassing. And when I came back, I was put on trial and criticized for going to New York and asking this contact for a million dollars, which is exactly what I was ordered to do. And while you're sitting there in front of all these people on trial, you, of course, can't say, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's what I was told to do. So it was a very, very harsh life. Um, and fortunately, and I was always in in leadership and in the inner circle around the leader who was a drunken 
narcissist, megalomaniac, um, former sociology professor. What was this organization you were in called? Because we know what it is, but we don't even know what the name of it was. Well, the final name was the Democratic Workers' Party. Okay, all right. Uh, In the beginning, we were the Workers' Party for Proletarian Socialism, but we decided that was a bit too much of a mouthful for the general public. (laughs) So, um, but most of our work was done through, especially early years, was done through front groups, and we never revealed that there was this organization Mm -hmm. behind everything. So we had like, you know, front groups to uh, like something called the Rebel Worker Organization Mm -hmm. to recruit workers. And we had an intellectual organization to recruit academics Mm -hmm. and a hospital organization to recruit Mm -hmm. hospital workers. The danger of that, obviously, of that kind of positioning is it's not in this holistic, healthy way of that to be able to receive feedback and be self-aware. It's really it almost always becomes weaponized. And what you're describing is. I'm going to tell you the criticism as a kernel of truth. I'm saying something. Even shrinks are guilty of doing that, by the way. You know, well, wh- mm-hmm. where's the truth mm-hmm. in what your partner said? Mm, the whole thing was abusive, so let's not go searching for the truth is always my attitude. Right. But that said, the being sent to go do the fundraising, you go do the fundraising, and then being criticized for doing the fundraising, that's exactly what happens in every narcissistic relationship. The person mm-hmm. will literally mm-hmm. be doing what they believe is the person's rule book, and then they're told, no, right. that's not what I wanted. That's all that gaslighting that completely undoes someone. But as you're going through this, and even these 20-hour workdays, I've heard that thematically time and time again in cult organizations, in cults and cults in general, of being able to do this inhumane amount of work. Is that a strategy to numb people, to exhaust mm-hmm. them so they can't question? Like, what is the goal with all of that? It is a way to keep you exhausted and keep you from questioning and thinking, and you're just mm-hmm. kind of functioning on rote. Mm-hmm. And that it also, you know, in most cases, it's going to feed into the philosophy, like we're the best and the greatest, and we're saving the world in some mm-hmm. one way or another. And so, of course, we, you know, we had this saying, like, nope, you know, another Chairman Mao, uh, the revolution isn't a tea party, right? So, you know, we if people complained, it was like, well, no one ever said this was going to be easy. You know, mm-hmm. you accepted this difficult life of being a cadre fighter for the revolution. Mm-hmm. So shut up and get to work. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's it's both a way to keep you exhausted, but also to kind of, again, break you down um, and just keep you working for the organization and supposedly meeting its goals. And another thing you mentioned, and I don't know if this is common in cult systems, you said you'd filled out this form with all kinds of sensitive information about you. What was that about? I mean, that was, I think, to make me feel vulnerable, Mm. to know that they knew all this stuff about me Mm -hmm. and they could pick away at pieces of it. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we had to do very early on was when we first joined was we had to write our class history, right? So Mm -hmm. the history of our life and our family from a point of view of social class, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. And so everybody had to do that. So already they had a lot of information about you so that when you wrote that, they could perhaps double check some things. But also um, it... Everybody wrote a class history, and then, of course, it got torn apart, and you were told it wasn't good enough, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so then people had to rewrite it and rewrite it until it was the history that they wanted. Mm -hmm. So it was another way to erase your background. But what you described there, like that, that filling out that form, getting this vulnerable information, again, that what we see dyadically in narcissistic relationships, I call it the intel gathering phase of the of the relationship mm-hmm. building. Like, you know, and it's really that the staring deeply into your eyes and say, tell me your, your tell me your deepest secret. You know, I want to know all about right. you. And you and the other person might think this is about intimacy or closeness, but rather they're getting this and filing it away for future use. It's gathering the stuff which in many t- cases, people are giving in what feels like good faith, right? Like this is what intimacy right. is. This is what trust is. They give it, right. and then it is like I always say: it's melted into bullets, and it is used to right. it, it's used to harm that right. person. That's why it's so difficult to trust when yeah. you get out, you know, because everything you've done and given away was used against you. Mm-hmm. And that difficulty with trust is the is the sort of the the legacy wound of anyone who's been in any form of toxic, abusive relational system, whether it's an right. individual, you know, one-on-one or whether it's in, in a cult system. What was the penny drop moment for you? When did you lift your head and say, mm, 
this feel this, this something's not quite right here. You might not have known it was a cult, or maybe you did, but what was that moment for you? Okay, well, this is a difficult story, but um, so in 1981, um, so I had been in about five years, and it was my birthday, and my mother didn't call. My mother was back in Milwaukee, mm. and my mother didn't call, and she always called me on my birthday, so I was like, this is weird. So I called my aunt, and who's her youngest sister, and I said, "What? Well, you know, I'm, I'm just surprised I haven't heard from mom, and she said, oh, your mother's in the hospital. They don't know what's wrong with her, and I'm like, what? So I called the hospital, and the, guy, and the doctor said, um, your mother's in a coma. We don't know what's wrong with her. If I were you, I'd get here. Mm -hmm. So I borrowed money from the cult and um, flew home. And when I got there, I demanded that one of the, we had doctors in our organization. And one of the doctors said, when you get there, tell them to give her a CAT scan. And this is before MRIs, I think. Mm -hmm. So I got there, I demanded they give her a CAT scan. And the results came back, and she had a, a glioblastoma brain tumor, which most people know or maybe don't, that it's one of the most malignant type of brain tumors. And so they said, uh, we can operate and remove it, but it'll grow right back, and she'll probably have four to six months to live. So I was like, okay. So they did the operation, and then she went through speech therapy and physical therapy and all of that, occupational therapy. And then at some point, and every day the cult called me, when are you coming back? When are you coming back? And I was staying with my aunt and my aunt said, oh, it's so, those people are so nice. They call you every day, <laughs> you know, not knowing they were calling me to come back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I, um, it was time for her to leave the hospital. You know, at some point they want to kick you out. So I called, the, I called my leader and I said, um, my mom's about to be discharged. There's nowhere for her to go. And I, I'd like permission to stay here with her until she dies. She has four to six months to live, and then I'll come back. And she said, oh, well, let me check with, you know, the queen, uh, the general secretary. So she called back a little while later and said, oh, we have a great idea. Bring your mom out to California. Well, my mom was, you know, a little Serbian lady who I don't know if she'd ever left Milwaukee, was very close to her Orthodox church, her Serbian Orthodox church. Um, so I, you know, like a good militant, I said, oh, okay. And they said, you know, we'll have one of your roommates move out. She can live in your house. So I went back. I got the room ready. I got a walker and all that stuff from the American Cancer Society. And my aunt put her on a plane and flew her out. So she was living in my house. Um very fairly weak, um, you know, wearing a wig because her head had been shaved and I had to help her with bathing and things like that. But I still had to work every day. And at some point I said to the cult, look, you let me bring, you told me to bring my mom home, but I never see her. And they said, oh, okay, you can, um, you can have dinner with her 45 minutes for dinner every day. I was like, oh, gee. <laughs> so I did that. And then they decided she should work for the cult. So they had her working at one of our front groups, I don't know, doing filing or something, and somebody picked her up and brought her home. So again, I wasn't seeing her every day because I'd leave at six in the morning. Um, so one night I came home at about 11 o'clock at night and I opened the door to her room and she was lying dead on the floor. And I was just, I was just broken and when I composed myself, I called my best friend who came over, who I had recruited into the cult. And I called my, I guess I called the coroner or whatever. I called the, my cult leader again, or my leadership person who was the second in command. And I said, my mom just died and I'm having the body flown home. And on the other side of the line, she said in this very harsh voice, well, you're not going home to the funeral, are you? And I looked at the phone and I thought, here I am killing myself, right? Working 20-hour days, blah, 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 to build a better world. And if this is the better world we're building, where I'm being told I can't go to my mother's funeral who just died in my house, there's some, you know. So I, it was the first time I ever defied the organization. I said, no, I am going. And I borrowed money again, and I flew home. 
I have absolutely no memory. I planned the funeral. I planned the big, in our tradition, we had a big Serbian dinner afterwards in the Serb hall and neighbors came and her sisters and halfway through I got up and left to take a flight back to San Francisco and when I got back, I was met at the airport and told, you know, report at 10 a.m. to such and such a place. So the next morning, I, there I was again, <clears throat> sitting in one of those high chairs with 40 people in front of me. And I was criticized for putting my mother ahead of the revolution. And after several hours of being berated for that, not being able to cry, show no emotion, um, that was a that was a breakdown for me. And that's when I was saying earlier, I knew I had to get out, but I could not figure out how to get out. I had nowhere to go. I had no money. I had a broken down car. I knew they'd come after me because I knew stuff. Um, and I was just like a walking nervous breakdown. Um, just like a robot. I lived like that for, you know, four and a half years. Um, so... That was my breaking point. It, it, first of all, I'm so sorry, uh, Dr. Yanya. That's it's just it, it's it's such a devastating story and one that stays with you in in mm -hmm. in so so many ways. You know, as I was listening to that, I I think what struck me was again, it's hard for me not to view this just lifted that at this is a whole group, but even in an individual abusive relationship, these are the kinds of things that would happen. Why do you have to spend so much time taking care of your mother? Well, this is inconvenient, right. Augusta. And, and in a way, it also felt like you were talking about this a horrifically abusive employer. Like, you need to report back. We don't care if this, we don't care if that. But it was obviously not just those things, which are terrible things. It was this larger system that had so enveloped you that, the talk, that mm -hmm. there was that bounded choice. There was no choice. I guess my question for you, going through, because you were going through so much raw psychological pain, grief, and loss, and 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 starting to recognize that the system you were in, there was something terribly, terribly wrong about what was going on. At this point, when all these terrible things were happening, were you, was the word cult even coming into your mind, or was it that I'm in something really? What was your word? Was it abusive, toxic, problematic? Like, I mean, it felt it, clearly you knew it was something wrong. Like, what this thing we say we're doing, this revolution, we're ma trying to make a better world, and yet the world we've created here is actually quite awful. So we're not meeting that goal. What was what was your framing on it when you realized something was wrong? I don't believe at that time I thought of the word cult, and and of course I don't have any journals from that time, because we weren't allowed to have anything like that. Um, I just know that I felt trapped. I felt incredibly trapped. And I knew it was wrong, and it was harsh, and it was hurting other people, and that I had hurt other people. Um, and in, in those four years, a lot of other really crappy stuff happened, uh, to both to me and to others. Um, I don't think I used the word cult until the very end hmm. uh, when we all got out. And so in so it just, again, crappy situation, bad, it's not good for me. How did you get out? So basically, um, you know, those of us who joined, as you said, in those early years, we were pretty burned out um, and pretty fed up and had been around her, you know, her inconsistencies and her madness and her corruption and mm -hmm. drunkenness and um, and... She was leaving, she left, uh, well, it's too long to go into the details, but she left to go to Bulgaria because that was her communist heaven at that point. We basically, the inner circle basically kind of all looked at each other and said, we're in a cult. And basically we called together all the members and some of the people who'd been expelled and we had this big meeting in our print shop and tried to tell people what was going on behind the scenes. and. For, it took about a week to convince people we were telling the truth and not mm -hmm. trying to have a coup. And then everybody just started pouring out their stories, you know, how they sold their blood to have enough money for their dues, how they never saw their spouse again after that person got expelled, how they gave their children to the spouse, who, you know, on and on with these horrific stories. Um, and then she was coming back. And so the night before she came back, we took a vote. 
And we voted unanimously to expel her and then a second vote unanimous to dissolve the organization. And then we had a, we picked a team of people who would meet with her and tell her when she came back. And one of the one of the women wore a wire so that all of us could hear what happened at that meeting. So basically you had 120 people who just had the rug ripped out from under them. <laughs> and you had a very stunned cult leader who was told the party's over. <laughs> um, and, you know, we, we all helped each other with resumes and hmm. getting jobs and clothes because we had no clothes. I mean, a lot of people... Like, I, I ran the publishing house, so a lot of people would say they worked at the publishing house, and I'd be their reference, mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm. you know, we just did whatever we could to support mm -hmm. each other. And that was the beginning of my recovery. And at that point, it became clear to all of you collectively it was a cult. It became clear to us all for a sliver of time. And then what happened is a lot of the people who were who had reputations on the left— mm -hmm and who wanted to carry on with political work, didn't want us to talk about what happened. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the rest of us were like, wait a minute, you know, the left needs to learn from this. And what do you mean we can't talk about what happened? And so a kind of a split happened uh, also about what should happen to the assets, because we had a print shop, we had a... a we had a publishing house. We had the doctor's office. We had something like 80 computers mm -hmm. in 1985 when people then, yeah. hardly, mm -hmm. that was a lot. And so we ended up having to take a vote for that as well. And our side won. Okay. And a few years a few years later, we each got a check for like, I don't know, $120 or something. <laughs> you know, it's like your 10-year pension. Um, so that, that was a bit of a... Uh, that was a, a struggle that went on for over a year between people, mostly by letters, because it was even before email. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, it was a depth. and 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 then it became it became clear. It didn't become clear. So it was the the dismantling of this really was much more that this was unhealthy, this was wrong, this was corrupt, but not that this was a cult. Right, for, for some of the people. For some, mm -hmm. And for a minority, for a minority of the people. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and even for myself, and so that kind of gave me the word cult. But when I was in New York, at the time, nobody talked about political cults. Everything was religious cults, right, or gurus, whatever. Yeah. And I thought, okay, well, maybe we weren't a cult. So I actually sat down and I made these lists. And this is what I have a lot of people I work with do. So, you know, I'm like, okay, religious cult, they have Jesus, we had Marx, they had the Bible, we had a book called The Training of the Cadre, they had this, we had that, they had, and I was like, yep, we were a cult. Mm -hmm, <laughs> right? mm -hmm. And I, and, and then I started going to conferences and speaking and, you know, letting people know there aren't just religious cults. And, of course, now we know today there's every kind of cult imaginable. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. And and you said, though, at that point, began your recovery. And what does recovery, when a person has their eyes open, this is, I was in an abusive organization, took took some time before you recognize it as a cult, but what, what is recovery from that like? You know, we have to accept that we'd been had, mm. that we'd been duped. We have to accept the things we did to other people or saw. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's, you know, you're basically left with a shattered self, yeah. right? Yeah. So I was 40 years old and I felt like I was 15. You know, I felt like I didn't know how to cross the street or yeah. open a bank mm -hmm. account. And then I was, you know, and you also feel like you're this alien being, you know, I would go on these business dinners, business lunches in New York, the cultural Mecca, right? I hadn't seen a movie, I'd seen three movies in 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I'd have to talk with business clients, and I didn't know what the hell to talk about. I, you know, I was like, from Mars. Mm -hmm. So there's that sense of alienation. There's a shame, like you don't want to tell people. There's the guilt of what you did. Um, there's enormous loss, you know, for, you lose friends, you've lost a lot of people along the way. You know, in my case, I was never even allowed to grieve my mother's death. Yeah. Um, it, it's everything. It's everything. And mm -hmm. so 
the best thing is, of course, you know, what we call psychoeducation, um, like not so much, not at all traditional therapy where you no. go in and the therapist says, okay, tell me what happened when you were two years old. You know, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. You first have to unpack the cult yeah. because if you don't, you're still looking at yourself through that mindset. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what most therapists don't get, which is why we do some training for therapists mm -hmm. at my, mm -hmm. um, my new nonprofit um, because cult, cult survivors need more therapists who get this. It's absolutely, you're right. Again, the psychoeducational piece is also sort of the one of the central pillars of working with survivors of narcissistic abuse. Because once mm -hmm. they understand what the traumatizing system looks like, once they understand what this is, and I think it's the hiding in plain sight of it too, is that a narcissistic person is often quite successful in the world at large, right? This is yes. not someone mm -hmm. who's looking at looking surly everywhere and everyone's pitying you. Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. Right. This is You're in a relationship with this person. Yeah. Everyone Everyone's thinking, oh, you're so lucky, you're part of something, or you're part of this relationship. But everything that you're sharing here, that and it's it, the one you started with was an interesting one to me. You have to accept that you've been had, right? And I understand that to be the subjective experience of a survivor, whether in a cold mm -hmm. system and a narcissistic relationship. From my seat as a, as a therapist, it's the, I think that when we feel we've been had, we feel foolish, like we've been played, mm -hmm. right? Like somebody just, just did a street mm -hmm. con on us. But in mm -hmm. fact, what had happened was all the healthy functioning parts of yourself, a desire to belong, a commitment to a cause, a drawing right. to like-minded people, healthy parts of yourself were drawn right. into something. Right. In a mm -hmm. relationship, it might be that you saw something in this person, that you believed in love, that you um, that you right. wanted to build a life with them. Ha healthy stuff. And then to find out that, in fact, that's not what this the social contract was on their side. It does right. feel like being had, but it's not really that you were foolish. It wasn't a, it wasn't that you were foolish and got played by a street right. con because you rolled up to a game of three-card Monty. It's more that you right. had gone in with all the best parts of yourself and ran Absolutely. into something harmful. Is that that self-forgiveness in that process that this was the best of you, you know, you exactly. were taken advantage of. And that 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 exploitativeness is an important part of the psychoeducation on what happens Absolutely. to these systems. I mean, I, I get asked all the time, you know, is there a certain personality type who joins a cult and I'm like you know what if there's any common denominator it's idealism mm. you know mm. it's people who want a better world a better self mm -hmm. a better family you know a better belief spiritual belief whatever but it's not because people as I said earlier are stupid weird crazy lazy that's not who cult members want right. I mean cult leaders want and so you you while you have to accept that you did it and went along with it, you also have to realize that there was nothing wrong with you. <laughs> right. Like this happens right. to everybody. Mm -hmm. It can mm -hmm. happen to anybody. Mm -hmm. And the forgiveness bit is so much more about self-forgiveness, yeah. which, which is which is one of the courses we taught, uh, forgiveness of self. I always say, you don't have to forgive the cult leader. Lord knows. I mean, there's all this sort of mindfulness woo-woo stuff today about forgiveness. No, you don't ever have to forgive the person who abused you. Who you have to forgive in this context is yourself. Yeah, yeah, no. Uh, you know, and, and deepen that understanding because they don't deserve Bupkis. No, the, the, they don't deserve Bupkis. They <laughs> sure as hell don't deserve forgiveness. You know, I think to no. me, forgiveness is a rather divine state, and it implies that there will be meaningful change when someone receives that forgiveness, and that a right. lot of people put forgiveness of other ahead of forgiveness of self. And it's that, again, you brought mm -hmm. the best of yourself. But you just said something so interesting I want to come back to, which is that cult, cult leaders, cult groups don't want lazy and crazy. Talk more about that because I again you're right. The trope is of the lost person who has no there. There's a, something off right. about them. That's why they get right. drawn into this and they got nothing else going on. You're actually saying it's quite different. Why is that? And you know what? What's that about? That the they don't want lazy well, and crazy. <clears throat> it's because they want. They want A-type personalities. They want people who are going to function, hmm. who are going to help raise money, who are going to recruit, who are going to bring in 
uh, contacts to lend legitimacy, to run the businesses, to run the internal organization, set up the infrastructure. Cult leaders are pretty lazy. They don't do very much except give orders and bask in their whateverness. So they need people around them who can perform. Um, and, you know, I always say, the cult's not there to take care of you. You're there to take care of the cult leader and the cult. Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I know in, in, in our case, if, if, if we had someone who joined, you know, as, say, a volunteer or general member, and they seemed a little fragile or maybe had too much sickness, we got rid of them. We were like, you know, this isn't right for you. Bye-bye. Um, we, we didn't want that. And and the Unification Church used to do that. You know, when people had breakdowns, they would just dump them in front of a mental hospital and drive away. I mean, there's no caring for you in a cult. And and of course they want people with money. So yeah. we saw that in in, in, in the Nexium, Nexium case, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. You know, or celebrities, Celebrity. you know, people who are going to, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. oh, l let's go coerce the Dalai Lama mm -hmm. into meeting with us. Let's give mm -hmm. him a million dollars, you know, yeah. and he and he can uh, wrap a cloth around Ranieri. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 absolutely. Exactly. <laughs> no, it really is. And I think that that, you know, the. It's so funny you say that cult leaders are actually the ones who are lazy. I hear more that it's entitlement, right? They're entitled to having everything well, done to them so if, or for mm -hmm. them or with them or as they wish. And so when people are entitled, almost by definition, they're lazy because they're not actually <laughs> attending to the things that need to get done, but they put it under right. this rubric of I shouldn't have to be the one who does this. I'm right. too important. I'm too divine. I'm too this. Right. It's, yeah. right. it's mm -hmm. the grandiosity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's yes. And we and and we as members rationalize that. Like I, I used to literally say to myself, "Well, we have Stalin in our lineage, and at least we haven't killed anyone yet." <laughs> so you rationalize along the way, yes. and and this yeah. is my, you know, this is my uh, metaphor about the shelf. You know, when you asked what was the breaking point, I think everybody who's in a cult, and I would imagine in a narcissistic relationship. They, you have doubts, but you have no way to express those doubts, right? Because you know you'll be punished in some way. So you store all these things in, on this shelf in the back of your head, mm -hmm. right? And then one day, one thing too much happens, mm -hmm. and the shelf breaks. Mm -hmm. That's what mm -hmm. happened when my mother died. Mm -hmm. And then you don't necessarily know it's a cult or a evil narcissist, but you know there's something wrong. And then you start thinking about getting out. And then mm -hmm, mm -hmm. how and when you're able to get out, again, is a very specific situation depending on the cult, the, the boyfriend, the whatever. Um, that's going to be easier or harder depending on the, on the context of that. I, I love that metaphor of the shelf breaking. Some people call it sort of a rock bottom. It is death by a thousand cuts. And then one day, and it could actually be a relatively, in your case, it was not inconsequential at all. It was the But it could absolute, be, yes. But it could be inconsequential. And that is the thing, that accumulation and that idea. And I think people can see that, you know, the 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 you know the yawning bookshelf that you put the one more book and boom, what just happened? I just put one book on it. And so I love that metaphor because I think that actually lines in though, it's interestingly a little bit. There's a beautiful complementarity to your work and the work of Dr. Jennifer Fried in the sense of she talks about this concept of betrayal blindness, sort mm -hmm. of seeing but not seeing the betrayal, but not encoding it and not processing it. So it's not right. like you're mm -hmm. in denial and it's not like you're delusional. You see it, right. you just don't register it in a way, in essence, that would break the shelf. But one day, those betrayals pile up in a way that the whole system busts. Now things become right. more clear, but there's a danger in seeing it for all the reasons you say. So there's a real compliment there. But I want to go back to recovery because if you weren't allowed to not only grieve major losses, in your case, the loss of your, your mother, but also in, in the group you were in and in all narcissistic relationships, you also have to curtail your expression of emotion. If you express emotion, oh, yeah. you will be gaslighted or shamed or belittled or be painted mm -hmm. as somebody who is dysregulated. And your emotion is never going to be empathized with 
mirrored or re- received with compassion. So people in narcissistic relationships really have them have themselves hemmed in to a relatively Shut restricted down. emotional expression. And I'll when I work with these clients in therapy, they'll they'll. Almost 99% of the time, apologize for crying. I'm so sorry I'm crying. I'm like, that's what happens in here. (laughs) Actually, this is purpose built for crying. And that's what happened to you in a cult. It's hard to learn how to. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Right. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I mean, and you'll find not only, I always say to employers, the best people you can hire are former cult members because they're such hard workers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) The manipulation of, of one's emotions in the cult is so major and has such a big impact during recovery because you're not used to feeling your feelings and you're not used to understanding your feelings. So things happen, you know, it's like, it's why people are triggered all the time and they overreact to the triggers because they're not used to being able to on their own, have an emotion and understand it. And so it's like such a roller coaster of a time, um, especially the first couple of years. It's just, you know, the, and, and, and having, and I'm sure this is true with narcissists, having lived years, in most cases, walking on eggshells, like having lived with that level of anxiety, right? And then you get out and there's triggers and panic attacks, and it just, you know, it becomes really overwhelming for people. Oh, it absolutely does. And, yeah, it, it, it does become – and you're right. Well, because the emotion can't be expressed, I, I right. think that actually is a driver of the sheer amount of panic that we see, panic attacks, panic disorder in survivors, mm-hmm. not just of cults but right. of narcissistic relationships because there's mm-hmm. no normative way – to express, exactly. I, I mean, again, as somebody, not been through a cult, but through so many narcissistic relationships that shape me developmentally, that I, to this day, struggle with crying, and it gets caught right here in my throat, like this. Mm. It's painful. I mean, it's painful mm. because of how much shame there was. So I, and I, so that's a microscopic level compared to what you're talking about systemically, and then nothing but apologies when that emotion looks like I've done something wrong. Anyone's done something wrong by a normal show of tears anger, sadness, worry, but it doesn't have some place to go, it comes out in panic. And I think that that's a really right. important, a really, right. really important uh, point. And, and feeling stuck, you know, feeling yeah. stuck and unable to make decisions. I mean, I remember people would say, oh, let's go to the movies. What do you want to say? And I'd say, I don't know, you decide. Mm-hmm. You know, it was mm-hmm. like I couldn't make a decision or I, I didn't want to take a stand on anything because – all those years when I took a stand, it was the wrong stand, right? Mm-hmm. So it's like you're just kind of like creeping through life. Um, Do you think that feeling stuck, though, could we? Could that be sort of that bounded choice extrapolating into mm. life even when the bound is gone? So it, oh, now there's no more yes. fear, but the bounded choice kind of follows you like a shadow. Right, yeah. A- and there is still fear. I mean, I was terrified that somebody was going to come after me, even though our cult was dissolved. Mm -hmm, Um, mm -hmm, You know, mm -hmm. so most cults thrive on paranoia. It's such a Mm -hmm. wonderful way to keep people, you know, enmeshed, Mm -hmm, right? mm -hmm. But this us versus them, fear of the outside world, whatever, you know, we were afraid, oh, the FBI Mm -hmm. was going to come and get us, Mm -hmm, you know. mm -hmm. And so all of that i mean it's so, I, I think people don't understand the the intensity of life in these kinds of situations mm-hmm. these systems um mm-hmm. and then afterwards trying to unpack all that uh and still deal with you know th- the bottom of the pyramid you know your health eating you know physical physical well-being exercise you know it's just it it must feel it must feel so lonely because no one else does get it. It's not the normative experience most people have had. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I mean that's why I do the work I do. And mm-hmm. we, you know, I've started this nonprofit to be able to have, you know, we have discussion groups for survivors. Um, we have them for regular, I call regular <laughs> survivors mm-hmm. of uh, cults or narcissistic relationships, trauma, and then also. Uh, groups for people who are born or raised in a cult um, and uh, people get so much out of those groups like Mm -hmm. just being able to spend an hour and a half with other people who know what you're talking about 
right? And you don't have to explain yourself and you mm -hmm. don't have to apologize. Mm -hmm. um, it's so powerful. And we certainly need more resources in our society and especially for people who are born and raised in a cult. There's nothing out there, nothing. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because I think that group often gets forgotten. Mm. I have talked with some people I, I've worked with, clinically with folks who have been born and raised into occult systems. I've also you know, talked talk with them in, in other interviews I've done and in, in other places I've worked. But I think you're absolutely right. This That is a very different group. What, what do things look like for that group? Because it is very different. And what have you observed? Well, you know, I um, it's really kind of my latest pet peeve that, mm -hmm. that there's so little out there for people because I, my last research project at the university was um, I interviewed 69 people who grew up in cults wow. and who left on their own. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the basis of my book, Escaping Utopia. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the stories were so incredible. I mean, the amount of sexual abuse and physical abuse yeah. is in every kind of cult of these young children is just, un I'd get off the phone from these interviews and just flop on my bed and cry and cry and cry. I mean, mm -hmm. it was just such hard stuff to hear. Um, but what happens is, you know, they get out and some of them don't even know their real names. Yeah. They don't yeah. have birth certificates. Mm -hmm. They don't know if they have anybody out there who can help them, any other relatives. They don't know how to drive. They don't know about getting a GED. Mm -hmm. Um they end up living on the streets a lot of times. They mm -hmm. end up doing sex work, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. on drugs, a lot of suicides, a, a horrific mm -hmm. amount of suicides. Uh, and and it's just it's just criminal. And, you know, people like that, and even some f adults who join cults and leave, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. they go to a domestic violence shelter and they don't qualify. They right. don't get That's let right. in. That's right. So yeah. where do they go? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and, and it's just, it's so difficult because they leave everything, mm -hmm. uh, especially if they leave on their own. Mm -hmm. And then they have to carry on with life. In many cases, their parents are still involved. Mm -hmm. And so do they have a relationship or not? Uh, I mean, there's so much to go through um, that it's um, it, it's really remarkable the ones who have survived and who've really some have done incredibly good work. I'll tell you in, in talking with some folks about this, there's some fo some people who didn't realize they were realize, were, uh, were raised in a cult. It was so mm -hmm. normalized within the family that as the adult right. child started distancing from the system, especially if there are multiple siblings and I'm thinking, you know, in some cases they were they weren't getting it and then someone else in the family said, "Did you know that such and such was a cult?" and they're like, "No, no, 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 no." And then they do the deep dive and there's this horrific level of betrayal that you're like, right. how could you? It wasn't even in about a they, they grew up and then they, again, they moved for a job. They weren't kept like, you know, they weren't sort of confined and imprisoned. Right. But once they left and were sort of mainstreamed into the world, that revelation, at first there's a tremendous, it's almost like stages of grief, right? Initially there's a right. tremendous amount of denial and anger. And then as the acceptance seeps in, one thing I had observed in several of these cases is the fair fair amount of rebellion and acting out. They were often raised in very, very sort of restricted ways. And then the acting out, whether it was sexual acting out or substances right. or anything, it actually could get very, very dangerous. And, right. and, and and that would be part of their sort of healing and recovery path. I know when you, in, in, in Escaping Utopia, I mean, just, you know, to put a finer point on it, and you had talked about this also earlier, about you know, you're talking about four year old children in forced labor. You had you'd given the example of a four year old child working in a bakery, and I, I'm just curious how does this how does this not run afoul of child labor laws? Well, you know it it is one of the ways we've been able to hold a few cults mm -hmm. accountable lately, mm -hmm. uh, or in the past few. There was an organization, the Alamo Foundation, and. Uh, he finally got convicted of labor trafficking. Mm. Um, you know, it was one of the charges against Ranieri, yeah. um, also against Larry Ray. So m most cults are doing labor trafficking. I mean, I worked yeah. for 10, 10 mm -hmm. years for nothing. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and I think what happens is, the, you know, the, uh, when, they, when there are public businesses and customers might look and see, oh, well, there's a five-year-old cleaning the tables. And either they think it's cute 
or right. they just go, whatever. Um, very few people are actually going to report it to the labor board. Correct. Correct. Um, yeah. We mm -hmm. we need people to be more conscientious about that um, and at least look into the situation. I mean, yeah, it could be a mom and pop shop and the kid is helping, or it could be a front for a cult, like the Yellow Deli, um, which is which are these cafes that are fronts for the twelve tribes. So. <laughs> wow. Your eyeballs. Has there ever been an has there ever been an attempt, Doctor Yanya, to use things like racketeering statutes to bring down cults? Like, because it can feel like organized crime, right? That many people yeah, colluding well, on a crime. Yeah, I mean that did work with Ranieri. Yeah. Um, the pro the here's the problem. First, the, there's a problem of finding lawyers who will even take on these cases. Mm because they think they're not going to win, mm -hmm. and of course mm -hmm. lawyers want to win, right, right. especially you know, if they're taking a case on contingency. Um, secondly, when people leave a cult, it's the decision to do some, take some kind of legal action is a very big step, and it's going to prolong your recovery, most likely. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. going to put you through so yes, much yes. crap. Yeah. If mm -hmm. anybody's mm -hmm. been involved in legal stuff, you know, depositions, mm -hmm. you know, they mm -hmm. just tear mm -hmm. you down. It just it can mm -hmm. go on for years. So a lot of people decide, I just, I, you know, I just don't, I just want to get on with my life, right? Mm -hmm. And then it's a matter of being at a high, having been at a high enough level that perhaps you have actual evidence. So, I mean, I've, I've worked with a group of people who were part of a cult in Atlanta, and they get and, and they were high level people who left inner circle. We created, they created, I should say, uh, binders of evidence mm -hmm. of every type: mm -hmm. medical malpractice, this sex trafficking, this, that, the other, um, financial fraud, and I, I was able to connect them to the FBI mm -hmm. uh, in in Atlanta, but mm -hmm. nothing came of it. You know, mm -hmm. nothing came of it. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's it's. It can be so disheartening. I mean, look what it took for Nexium. You know, it took Catherine Oxenberg knowing the governor or somebody that finally they, you know, after reporting things for years, finally somebody acted on it. So it's a it's a big struggle to to get that to happen. How much of this is because cults are able to hide behind r religious um, religion. protection? Because it does <laughs> feel like religious organizations somehow manage to really oh, skirt yeah. the law. Is that a sort of another loophole yes. that they can play on? We've talked about people healing from this. We've talked about people getting in. We've talked about people getting out. Do people get pulled back in? So a person does the work, says, I'm out. This is a cult. This is wrong. No, no, no. They go, they leave. Have you heard of situations where even after making that courageous leap out, they get sucked back into the system? Oh, sure. In, 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 into either the same or a different system. Um, but generally, those are people who didn't do the psychoeducational recovery. Mm, if you don't, mm, if you don't mm. spend time doing mm. the proper recovery, where you understand what the heck happened to you and how it happened, it's really easy to get involved in something else. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we call those cult hoppers. Um, yeah, and you know, I've worked, I've worked with people yeah. who've been in three, four, five different yeah. cults before they mm -hmm. finally like mm -hmm. enough. You know, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that's interesting. so yes, that does happen. Yeah, and you know, you going back to what you're saying before, those like we're talking about these loopholes, right? Become a religion, you know, or or you know, find ways to hide. Something that's come up in your writing that actually was incredibly unsettling to me, Dr. Yanya, was this idea of cult apologists. And these are not, mm. and these are people who have educational credentials and from the throne of that legitimacy are, are basically saying you can't call groups cults. Can you break that down? Because that piece was actually quite uh, s stunning to me. Yes, um, that's been a decades-long problem. Wow. So back in the, I would say, probably the um, 70s and 80s, uh, when Dr. Margaret Singer, uh, who was a clinical psychologist yeah, yeah. at Berkeley, mm -hmm. and she was the main uh, sort of cult expert at the time, and eventually she was, she was a dear friend of mine and my mentor. Um, Margaret had done some legal cases 
uh, involving some cults. And she was she was brilliant in the courtroom, and she was winning cases hand over fist for families or for former members. So the cults realized they needed to get experts on their side. So somehow they convinced some of these academics that um, this was all about freedom of religion. And even though, as we know, not all cults are religious. Um, and so a number of academics, some I think genuinely believe they're doing it to defend freedom of religion. Most of them, in my opinion, are doing it because they benefit. Yeah. Um, they work closely with the cults. Mm -hmm. um, they make their money that way. Um, and so now we have this sort of gaggle of people who've been very well coordinated over time, some very influential academics or individual professionals. Um, and they do things like, in my case, they try to keep me from testifying in court cases. They have um, gotten into the textbooks. So any, any Psych 1 or Sociology 1 textbook you pick up is going to say, oh, cults are really just nice new religions. Um, there's no such thing as brainwashing. This is all just disgruntled former members who are making up stories. It's horrific. It really is. Um, and how these people sleep at night, I don't know. I don't. Uh, <laughs> I, you know, I think what's stunning to me that anyone would be an apologist for these systems is you were talking. They go to court and defend them. It's, you're, but you're talking about a group phenomenology <laughs> that we're seeing replicated in all of these individual relationships. We see it replicated in sexual assault. We see it replicated in coercive control. We see it replicated in domestic abuse. You know, cults. Um, you know, cults are really basically a, a scaling up of those individual dynamics, and mm -hmm. that they've they've jumped on that word and try to put it in this. It's 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 ghastly. I want to get back to the one more thing you said. I made a note to come back to this. You said this word <laughs> brainwashing is also an issue. We we all use it rather cavalierly, but you said that there's some mm -hmm. issues with this word. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Well, um, <clears throat> so I think there's two things. The word, you know, the word got, the word originated in, during, during the 50s um, when a journalist who was actually a CIA agent was in China and wrote a book called uh, Brainwashing in Red China. So this was during oh. what we called the Red Scare, right? And he described what was going on in Chairman Mao's China, you know, Mao took over the country in 1949 when mm -hmm. they had the revolution. So that word, then there was that movie, The Manchurian Candidate. Mm -hmm, so it, it all got quite exaggerated. Like, you know, our government apparently believed that the, the Russians and the Chinese had some magic potion that would turn people into these political robots who would do whatever. And so, you know, it all got sensationalized in a way. Mm -hmm. But the reality is, you know, there there's other works by Robert J. Lifton and Edgar Schein, yeah. who studied people coming out of mm -hmm. uh, prison camps and out of communist China and wrote their books on thought reform and coercive persuasion and described exactly what that is, which is essentially indoctrination or re or we could call it mm -hmm. as a sociologist i sometimes call it re-socialization mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. you're being re-socialized into this new environment mm -hmm. then come along the cult apologists who want to convince everyone there's no such thing as brainwashing and that it was you know it's just a ridiculous idea that was totally disregarded by all of the American Psychological Association and all that. And it should never be accepted in the courts. And they did a whole campaign to the media and said, don't ever use the word brainwashing. Don't use the word cult. If something happens, here's a list of people you should talk to, not, you know, not these other people. And so it's, it's in conjunction with the other work that they do. So while I absolutely believe there is such a thing as brainwashing. I was one of the main brainwashers in my cult. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, at one point, the leader called me, called me to a meeting and said, I want you to design a program that lets them know that they are accepting being brainwashed. Um, and so 
I know it exists. I know it happened to me. I can give you prime examples. Um, but I try not to use the word because of this controversy. Yeah, 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 um, yeah, yeah. And so mm -hmm. I use I use indoctrination and I use bounded choice as the result. Mm. Um, and I'm able to take that into courts and have a grand old time. So, yeah, I, I mean, I, I it's funny you say that because I come up against something very similar, where. The, the argument, if you will, against using terms like narcissism and narcissistic abuse is we are often working with the survivor, the person who's been through this. That's who's more likely to show up in a therapist's office, not the person who's doing the emotional abuse and manipulation. And so the thing that's often tossed back is, well, you're going on that person's you know, um, description of the situation. I'm thinking they're not going to, who's going to spend this much money to tell me a lie about someone, but okay. And <laughs> you shouldn't be using narcissism because it represents a potentially diagnostic term, which is a load of, you know, what, because in fact, right. you know, it's yeah. not, it's a description of a personality style that lines up with something called antagonism. But I do the same thing. I'll use words like antagonism, which, you know, that the, there is actually a whole world of narcissism apologists out there, many of whom also mm -hmm. have PhDs. So I, I get it. It's certainly not at the same level because cults, by definition, do harm. There's there's no such thing as a good cult. Thank um, you, thank you, know? you thank you. <laughs> so you know that that because that doesn't that's not a thing. I would say. I, it would be very heavy-handed for me to say there's no such thing as a good narcissist. I think many of us do love people with those personality styles in our lives, but we recognize these are extraordinarily limited relationships. Mm -hmm. So it, the same malign wouldn't apply, right? But in the case of cults, it's just, again, there's no such thing as a good cult. So I think that that's, that's an important, um, you know, it's, it's but it's it's a fascinating piece. So I thought, how could someone be a, an apologist? And then I was like, ooh, getting a little <laughs> close to the side of the throat there because I was really, really, <laughs> really struck by that um you know by that by that comment you a, a little while ago dr yanya you mentioned something you called you used the term new religious movement could you explain that term to us cuz i'm not sure exactly what that means well that's that's the term the cult apologists have come up with so oh. what they're saying right and and what's funny about it is it certainly doesn't cover cults like the one i was in so yeah. i mean i was not in a new religious movement but in their in their effort to pretend that they're defending religion, they'll say things like, you know, this is just a new religious movement and they're just going through, you know, growing pains and we should just let them do what they want to do and then they'll grow up and get over it. And it's like, hello. <laughs> so, uh, You've also worked with family members who watch other family members get pulled into cults, right? That's a uniquely painful position. So these are the, so now we're talking about the people who they, they themselves are not getting into a cult, but they're watching a loved one get pulled in. What's some? Let's say someone's listening to this and they're thinking, "This is what I'm worried about with my." child or even my partner, or maybe they're spending money and giving it to this organization and harming fi family finances or wasting their own money, maybe whoever it is, someone close to you. What would your guidance be? What should they be looking for if they're worried that this might be happening to someone? Well, certainly, if they're giving away money to something that seems fishy, mm -hmm. um, I often advise families, if they can afford it, to hire a private investigator mm -hmm. and sort of look into the background of the energy worker or whoever it is or whatever the organization is or person leading it um, to find out, you know, what's there in the background. Um, people changing, you know, people's personalities changing. They only talk about one thing. Uh, they're very defensive. They're spending less and less time with you. They're spending less and less time doing things they used to do and love. Uh, you know, all of those kinds. There's just that kind of pulling away that happens. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Or I should say being pulled away. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and, you know, I think most families these days recognize it pretty quickly. I've, hmm. I mean, I have so many spouses either worried about a spouse wow. or parents worried about children, or I even am working with children who are worried about parents. Wow. Um, so it happens in, you know, in every form. And and this is where the, the shelf in the back of the head comes in, because what families want to do, or friends, whoever, 
is plant seeds on that shelf, right? Plant seeds that'll get that shelf to break one day and not confront and not challenge. And, um, you know, you don't have to agree, but you don't ever want to cut somebody off. If you're mm -hmm. able to have contact, that is so important and do whatever you can to retain mm -hmm. that contact. Mm -hmm. Let, if they want to cut you off, fine, but don't ever cut them off, no matter how goofy they get <laughs> or yeah. seem to you, Yeah. right? And always remind them of good times, good times mm -hmm. together, that, mm -hmm. that there was another world out there. I, you know, I always say you want to tug at their emotional heartstrings. You want to reawaken mm -hmm. who they were before and what they liked before mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. who you were to them before. Yeah. So whether it's sending them their favorite cookies or s sending a postcard from Aunt Mary, whatever it is, something that's going to go, oh, oh, yeah, I remember Aunt Mary. She was always so nice to me, mm -hmm. you know, boing. Can you talk about critical compassion? Sure. Um, so what I mean by that is people uh, will often get involved in something that, you know, to you might seem really unusual or crazy or ridiculous or offensive. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I actually came up with this term during the sheltered in year mm -hmm. when I was getting so much contact from people whose relatives or friends or whoever were getting into QAnon or the anti-vaxxer mm -hmm. movement and mm -hmm. the far right stuff. And, you know, they they couldn't understand it. And they certainly didn't want to approve. I don't want to approve that you're now joining this neo-Nazi yeah. group. You know, mm -hmm. how can I do that? And so the idea of critical compassion is that it's so important to understand that that person is going through something. And that that person thinks they have found something that at that moment is speaking to them. Yep. And while you mm -hmm. may know it's harmful or may lead to harm, that's not what you want to say to them right away, right? You want to let them know that you're there for them, that you love them, that you don't want to have political arguments with them or spiritual arguments, whatever, that, you know, it's hard to say you respect something when you don't. Mm -hmm. So you can say, you know, I honor that this is what you believe right now, but let's go fishing. Remember how much fun we used to have when we went fishing yeah. and, and, and try to not get into those confrontational discussions or arguments. But as I was saying earlier, tap into who the person was before. Try to reawaken that. I absolutely love this in the sense of this again, narcissistic abuse, watching your your friend who's in a toxic marriage or you know or friendship or whatever the ten the temptation is to walk in right through the front door and say he's a bad guy get out of this and i say that has right. never ever worked again i love this right. term because it is a it recognizes, and I love how you put it, they're going through something. They are going through something. And to just write it off as they're crazy or they're being brainwashed or they don't understand what's happening. First of all, you're 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 dis being dismissive of someone you care about. Right. And they are they are going through something. And it is about holding space. I mean, this is very much the guidance I give to anyone who's trying to be a supporter is that you don't you, this is about you being a soft place to land and recognizing, yes, it's painful to watch this, but there's no pushing fast forward on this. But I love that framing of of suggesting that they do that thing with you. That was the joyful thing you did with them. That's so great. And it's so nice to hear the sociologist and psychologist finding that complimentary space <laughs> and how that would work with individual clients. It's really, um, uh, really amazing. We've been talking a lot about Nexium and Keith Raniere, mm -hmm. but you can't tell the story of Nexium without talking about Nancy Saltzman. Uh. Okay. So she was the, she was the number two again a woman holding a high position in in a cult called space. Would you say that Nancy because Nancy en engaged in what I would consider perpetrating level behavior? Would you say she was experiencing bounded choice? I would say that. I would say that she was imposing bounded choice on others mm -hmm. um, through her practices, um, through her behavior. I believe that 
she herself benefited much more personally mm -hmm. than someone who is who is truly just responding on rote, even though it may not feel like that. Mm -hmm. um, so certainly she was manipulated by Ranieri. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't I don't believe she was indoctrinated in the same way as other people. She, she, she helped create that system, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Their their tech or whatever they call it, the, mm -hmm. the program, which I'm sure when she gets out of prison, she'll just carry on with. Mm. Um, so I I don't put her in the same category as Isabella Pollock or even Claire Bronfman, really. Uh, who Interesting. Right. Okay, so let's talk about Claire Bronfman, because I have to tell you, I felt enraged at her. Claire could still be coming at people in that system is is troubling to me. And Claire was also underwriting this. Without her money, I don't know that this thing, this thing would have gotten so far down the track. So mm -hmm. where is that difference between Claire? I understand Nancy created curricula. Nancy, you know, she will claim that she didn't know any of the terrible stuff that was happening. But I mean, I, exactly. Okay. So, but what, Claire continues to be an apologist for Ranieri, it feels like, and financed it. Actually gave, it allowed this organization to seemingly cross international lines, get more of the reach, mount up a legal defense for him. Where's the difference? I, I'd say the difference is that Claire was truly indoctrinated. Uh -huh. That Claire, Claire was someone who... I think has a ninth grade education who was very in a sense needy as the the poor little rich girl mm -hmm. um, who Ranieri manipulated all those years. I agree she let her money be used for terrible things mm -hmm. against other people, but when when the thing got busted and she got arrested. And she has terrible lawyers. She has never had a psychological evaluation. Mm -hmm. She has never had any kind of counseling. Where here you have Nancy Salzman on video, you know, like supposedly crying over her membership and her submission to him, which is pure BS as far as I'm concerned. But... I think Claire Brown, Claire Brown, I can understand people being upset and angry, mm -hmm. but here's where critical compassion comes in, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I do believe Claire is in a very different situation, and that she would not still be a true believer if she had the right kind of care once mm -hmm. she got mm -hmm. and out of the snare. So that, that takes me to the next question, though. Okay, so the people who ended up in sort of perpetrating, so people who were perpetrated against in cult spaces, who become perpetrators, who are apologists, even when the whole thing blows up, they didn't get the help. But don't most of these people remain deeply resistant to getting the help, even when it's, a, you need to do this, you need to do that? Isn't would am I correct in understanding that there's a fair amount of resistance to doing that, or is that not the case? I mean, I don't know if there's resistance on her part. In I mean, general, she is, in general. Well, sure. There, of course, there's going to be resistance mm -hmm. uh, initially. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why sometimes these things have to be court ordered mm -hmm. in, in mm -hmm. case where there's actually mm -hmm. been arrests made mm -hmm. or charges mm -hmm. made. Um, you know. That's the defensiveness, you know. And they're going back to the issue of family members who are trying to support a, a family member who may have gotten, you know, into one of these systems or remains in a cult. Maybe if we could get them therapy, that family member is going to say no, 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 no. They are enduring all of the, the, the coercion and the exploitation of being in a cult. No, 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 no. And then some of them, even if the whole thing does manage to blow up, may still not be willing to receive 
what they need. Like you said, the psychoeducation, the 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 therapeutic right. work, whatever whatever that looks like for any given individual, it creates this right. incredibly frustrating space because as long as using Claire Bronfman's example, as long as someone like Claire Bronfman is still going to believe in Ranieri's innocence and still have access to money, thank goodness he's away for 100 and plus years because it feels like had he not been with her money, this whole thing would have started again. Well, and and I think the fact that they've been, been able to have contact and have contact with that crew on the outside um yet right Mm -hmm. so my understanding is she is now cut off from him Ah. and from those other Mm -hmm. believers that should help because all of that obviously was going to keep reinforcing Mm -hmm. her Mm -hmm. in her Mm closed-mindedness so if she isn't having contact with them and if she is ordered by the court to go through an evaluation and if they get the right people to talk with her and meet with her, I think there, you know, there is hope that she'll see the light. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And interesting. I, I just, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, we don't know. Yeah. You'd like you, I mean, and I yeah. think I, I, I guess it's a, you know, again, um, Dr. Fried would argue that betrayal blindness can be broken through, that there is a point, just somebody who shows it to you clearly and you're not having those other kinds of, um, Uh, conspiratorial voices in your ear that you might be able to see it. What I really want to talk about, because I think this is a really important thing for people to learn about, and I'm so happy to learn about this, is you have a new nonprofit, the Lalish Mm -hmm. Center for Cults and Coercion. Can you tell us about uh, your your new nonprofit and the work that this organization is doing? Sure. Um, Well, I I started the nonprofit because... I'm about to be 78 years old, um, which is starting to seem old. <laughs> anyway, I, I realized that I have been doing all of this work all these years, both with families, with survivors, yeah. you know, uh, and also all the writing that I've done. And I want to make sure that there's some kind of legacy, you know, that I don't just fall down one day and it's all gone. Um, so I have a team of people who are absolutely terrific. They're all survivors um, and with various skills. Um, Beth Metanier is a trauma therapist who herself <clears throat> herself went, was in one of those awful boarding schools in the troubled teen industry. Mm. And then when she got out, you know, eventually she went to university, got her degree. So she's been a trauma therapist for like 25 years, lots of experience. What I'm trying to do is provide resources to help survivors and families um, with courses, discussion groups. We have writing workshops, um, you know, all kinds of things like that. We're going to do a course on um, sort of how cults um, basically take from mainstream religions and and use it against their followers um mm. which i yeah, which is actually could be a course for the general public not yes it could yes it survivors. could yeah 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 um, and and um so we're doing you know whatever we can um we we've obtained um our tax deductible status so we'll be able to accept donations because we provide Great. scholarships for almost all of our resources because many Great. many survivors no. don't don't have don't have the means um and so yeah and my hope is that by sort of training and doing professional development with the core team and the new people that we're bringing on board as time goes on um people will be able to you know carry on what i've been doing and and reach yeah. even more people I think it's fantastic, and I, I sometimes wonder in the era of social media and the way information people have now. I mean, there's there's a blessing to these you know these open media platforms that people can get the word out, but there's also a danger of you know now there's more there's more ways to get the word out, and I actually think that we might see sort of a sad golden age of cults as people are able to mm. do more of this work and recruit using those mechanisms. What are some examples of cults or cult organizations that we may not typically think of as being cults? Well, um, you know, I once 
I once worked with someone who was in a dog training cult. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> right? I get that. I get so, that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I think any any kind of organization that has a um, a tough leader, usually considered charismatic, that has um, that doesn't have clear lines of accountability, that doesn't have transparency. I think any any organization like that can become a cult yeah. because you know people get carried away with their power and they start abusing their power. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. And so, I I think it, you know there's karate cults. Hmm. Uh, certainly, we've talked about there's yoga cults. There's mm-hmm. acting workshop mm-hmm, cults mm-hmm. Uh, for you guys in Hollywood. There's, mm-hmm. you oh, know. absolutely. I've heard of those. Yeah. Mm-hmm. MLMs, yeah, I mean, wonder, right? ML, multi-level oh, marketing. M- multi-level marketing. Absolutely. And of course, so many of these management and leadership yes. training courses yes. that people are sent to from work. I mean, all of that, that started again, back in the sixties and seventies, you know, with uh, LifeSpring and Est and SciWorld, that has so mushroomed and so grown and so seeped into the business world. I mean, millions, billions, actually billions, billions. of dollars are spent every year mm-hmm. on those programs. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, I know. And, um, mm-hmm. and employees are sent to them and they can't say, no, I'm not going to go because their job is in jeopardy. Um so, you know, what I always say to people is do your research, like slow yeah. down. If they tell you the guru is only going to be here today so that you can see him lift off the <laughs> cushion in a yellow light, he'll be back. Don't worry. And do your research. I mean, just like you were buying a car. You don't buy the first car you see. Yeah. So yeah. look on as much as cults are able to use the Internet and social media to recruit There's also an enormous amount of information on the internet about all of these groups and organizations Mm -hmm. and leaders and con artists and energy workers and this one and that one. So check everything out before you sign on to something. We're going to have people listening to this saying, you know, what about my dog training group or my hot yoga studio or my um, my neighbor who keeps making me come to her supplement sales evenings or whatever? Is there a checklist or anything out there that people could use to sort of ask themselves, am I in a cult? Well, you know, the checklists are transparency, having your questions answered. Like if you ask questions and they say, oh, just come to one more workshop, then you can ask that question. By then you've forgotten the question, Mm -hmm. right? Um, Being able to challenge the leader, question the leader, knowing where the finances come from and where they go, um, you know, having lines of accountability, not using up all your time, uh, you know, asking you to change things about yourself, change your name, things yeah. like that. Uh, yes, change you know, your start, name. Yeah. Starting, mm-hmm. starting to strip away your identity. Yeah. Um, you know, I think all of those are, are, are kind of red flags. Um, more than two-thirds of people who get recruited are recruited by a friend, a family member, or Bingo. a co-worker. That's what I was going to ask. So about. that's the rub, right? Mm-hmm. It's someone you know who is introducing you to something, and it's much harder for us to say no yeah. to someone we know. Yep. Yep. So... Mm-hmm. You know, just be on guard. I swear to God, I don't want to say there's a cult under every bush, but I think there is. <laughs> there's a lot of them. You know, one of the things I've noticed, too, is that there's a real pressure to recruit, you know, like bring in people that there could be a financial incentive uh, yeah. to that or even a congratulations to that, like you're doing right mm-hmm. by the organization. Another thing I also Absolutely. noticed, there's like step one, step two, step three. I want to be a step five. I want to be a step nine or there'll be colors or medals or something associated mm-hmm. with that each level up. So so it's it's a bit of um, carrot dangling and and creating yes. greater buy-in and usually to advance in that organization is more and more money deeper deeper indoctrination but I would also say it fosters a greater sense of belonging you know which is something I've noticed right. come up over and over with clients I've worked with right. who are in cult systems what do you if there was one thing what do you wish people understood more about cults. Well, I think for me, the the one thing 
is that there's nothing wrong with the people who join cults. I mean, I think the stigma of for people who've been in a cult is still so rampant in our society. And it's why I do as much public education as I can. I mean, as much as I work with survivors, I, I so want the public and our societal institutions to understand just how clever these groups are and how there's absolutely nothing wrong with someone who gets enmeshed in one of these. And we need to Thank have you. more compassion. We need to have more understanding. Yeah. I, it's, a, yeah. it's a miracle if it isn't you. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's so. it. And that more compassion, I say this about survivors of narcissistic abuse all the time who are said, oh, come on, how bad could it be? And if it was that bad, why didn't you get out? That's the question. Why didn't she over. leave? Well, right. Exactly. Well, all of that. So right. I love that. And I thank you for saying that because I do think, you know, what ends up happening when people keep pathologizing the people who get into the cults, we actually take the heat off of what really should be scrutinized, which exactly. is the cult leader and the cult organization. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Dr. Yanya. In our first takeaway, almost every aspect of a cult system sounds like a narcissistic relationship. The expectation of unwavering and unquestioning loyalty, obedience, requiring a person to fully surrender themselves, preying on guilt, shame, anger, love, fear, control, eroding self-trust and tearing a person down and building them back in a way the cult leader wants. And we know that it is difficult for people to break out of cults, that they will defend them while they are in them and find themselves changed and shaped in new and unrecognizable ways. It's similar to how it can feel impossible to leave a narcissistic relationship for a long time. These parallels are important for survivors to realize in order to foster self-forgiveness and self-compassion as they understand how imprisoning these relationships and systems are. For this next takeaway, one element of Dr. Yanya's experience in the cult and the painful story of her mother's death hit me after the interview. As she had to face up to such a callous lack of empathy in the face of her mother's passing from the cult, it was an eye-opening moment. But interestingly, Dr. Yanya focused on the idea that they were supposed to be building a better world. And if this is what this looks like, then that is not okay. But after so much time of being made to ignore and deny her emotions, what she didn't share that jumped out at her is recognizing how badly she was being treated. Sometimes when we are in abusive relationships of any kind, we recognize intellectually what's wrong, but it can take longer to clearly see and feel that we are being emotionally harmed and to recognize that it is not okay. For our next takeaway, Many of the techniques that Dr. Yanya suggests as useful for survivors coming out of cults are very similar to what works with survivors of narcissistic relationships, such as psychoeducation about how a cult works, giving yourself enough time to adjust to life outside of the cult system, and self-forgiveness. She also frames recovery from a cult relationship as a recovery of emotion and learning to emotionally respond to situations. Toxic relationships are places where emotions are shamed or not tolerated, and it takes a minute to learn that emotional vocabulary again or for the very first time. In this next takeaway, the concepts of bounded choice, self-sealing systems, and the shelf are all really useful tools that can help us understand what happens to people in narcissistically and other forms of emotionally abusive relationships. The shaming that often happens to people in narcissistic relationships, why didn't you just leave, doesn't account for how constrained choice can be 
when a person is being emotionally subjugated. We use the analogy of there being a door, but a person believing that the door is locked or not seeing it at all. And the manipulation inherent in an abusive relationship means that it is like the narcissistic relationship has its own weather and the distortion of reality that can make it feel like there is no escape. I really appreciated this concept of the shelf, the betrayals and confusion and invalidations and harm don't get forgotten, but they get put on this shelf in the back of your mind until that moment when the shelf breaks and you see it. That is a painful, scary, but also liberating moment for any survivor of a toxic relationship, whether it is a cult or just a regular invalidating relationship. In our next takeaway, I really appreciated her perspective on critical compassion because it is really applicable to people who are trying to be supportive of someone who may be in a narcissistic relationship. The temptation is to tell someone to get out or try to make them see what it really is. Her approach of critical compassion informs supporters that you don't need to get into an argument, but rather tap into the memories and your history with them and show them what life has looked like and what life could look like. Many times we don't know what to say to someone who is in a relationship that is emotionally harming them. And this concept of critical compassion gives us tools for how to respond. For our last takeaway, while there is no official checklist to determine whether an organization that you may be getting involved with is a cult, Dr. Yanya offers some key points such as looking at transparency on how the organization is run and on the finances, their willingness to answer your questions without luring you into more classes and programs, your ability to be able to challenge the leader without being silenced or shamed, hard sells and asking you to make decisions quickly, lines of accountability, if they mandate anything that shapes or undercuts or strips your identity, such as asking you to change your name, pressure to recruit or draw in new members into the organization.